Hello everybody, welcome to lesson 5 of To Kill a Mockingbird. In this lesson, we'll be going through chapters 4, 5 and 6. The English Department of St. Patrick's CBC is making all of their material for online lessons available to all schools in South Africa. Please feel free to like and share this so that as many pupils can benefit from it as possible. I'll be referring to the Heinemann edition of the novel. Keep track of the pages by using a bookmark, especially if you're using a different edition. These are the four areas that I would like you to focus on in these chapters. Firstly, the gifts that Scott and Jem will find in a tree. The continuing fascination with Boo Radley as a character. Miss Maudie Atkinson, a neighbour and a strong female role in the novel. And then, of course, gender, an ongoing theme in the novel. These are your vocab words for this section. Please add them to the list that you have already started at the back of your notebook. Look out for the words as we read. Let's get started with chapter four. Make sure that you have your pens and pencils ready for annotation and your notebook so that you can take notes as we go along. I'm going to skip the first section of this chapter and start at the top of page 39, the third line. As the year passed, released from school 30 minutes before Jem, who had to stay until 3 o'clock, I ran by the Radley place as fast as I could, not stopping until I reached the safety of our front porch. One afternoon as I raced by, something caught my eye and caught it in such a way that I took a deep breath, a long look around, and went back. Two live oaks stood at the edge of the Radley lot. Their roots reached out into the side road and made it bumpy. Something about one of the trees attracted my attention. Some tin foil was sticking in a knot hole just above my eye level, winking at me in the afternoon sun. I stood on tiptoe hastily looked around once more, reached into the hole, and withdrew two pieces of chewing gum minus their outer wrappers. My first impulse was to get it into my mouth as quickly as possible, but I remembered where I was. I ran home and on our front porch I examined my loot. The gum looked fresh, I sniffed it, and it smelled all right. I licked it and waited for a while, and when I did not die, I crammed it into my mouth, Wrigley's double mint. When Jem came home, he asked me where I got such a wad. I told him I found it. Don't eat things you find, Scout. Oh, this wasn't on the ground. It was in a tree. Well, it was. It was sticking in that tree yonder, the one coming from school. Spit it out right now. Well, I spat it out. The tang was fading anyway. Well, I've been chewing it all afternoon, and I ain't dead yet, not even sick. Don't you know you're not supposed to even touch the trees over there? You'll get killed if you do. Well, you touched the house once. Well, that was different. You go gargle right now, you hear me? Ain't neither. It'll take the taste out of my mouth. Well, you don't, and I'll tell Calpurnia on you. Next page. Skip the first paragraph. Summer was on the way. Jem and I awaited it with impatience. Summer was our best season. It was sleeping on the back screened porch in cots or trying to sleep in the treehouse. Summer was everything good to eat. It was a thousand colours in a parched landscape. But most of all, summer was dill. 
The authorities released us early the last day of school and Jem and I walked home together. You reckon old Dill be coming home tomorrow? Ah, oh, probably day after. Mississippi turns them loose a day later. As we came to the live oaks at the Radley place, I raised my finger to point for the hundredth time to the knot hole where I had found the chewing gum, trying to make Jem believe I had found it there and found myself pointing at another piece of tin foil. Oh, I see it, Scott. I see it. Jem looked around, reached up and gingerly pocketed a tiny, shiny package. We ran home and on the front porch we looked at a small box, patchworked, with bits of tin foil collected from chewing gum wrappers. It was the kind of box wedding rings came in, purple velvet with a minute catch. Jem flicked open the tiny catch. Inside were two scrubbed and polished pennies, one on top of the other. Indian heads, 196, and Scott, one of them's 1900. These are real old. 1900? Say, hush a minute, I'm thinking. Jem, you reckon that's somebody's hiding place? No, oh, don't anybody much but us pass by here, there, unless it's some grown persons. <laughs> grown folks don't have hiding places. You reckon we ought to keep them, Jem? Oh, I don't know what we could do, Scott. Who would we give them back to? I know for a fact don't anybody go by there. Cecil goes by the back street and all the way around by town to get home. Cecil Jacobs, who lived at the far end of our street next door to the post office, walked a total of one mile per school day to avoid the Radley place and old Mrs. Henry Lafayette Dubose. Mrs. Dubose lived two doors up the street from us. Neighbourhood opinion was unanimous that Mrs. Dubose was the meanest old woman who ever lived. A gem wouldn't go by her place without Atticus beside him. Well, what do you reckon we ought to do, Jem? Well, finders were keepers, unless title was proven. Tell you what, said Jem. We'll keep them till school starts. Then go around and ask everybody if they're theirs. They're some bus childs, maybe. He was too taken up with getting out of school today and forgot them. These are somebody's, I know that. See how they've been slicked up? They've been saved. Yeah, but why should somebody want to put chewing gum like that away? Y you know it doesn't last. Oh, I don't know, Scott, but these are important to somebody. Well, how's that, Jim? Well, Indian heads, well, they come from the Indians. They're real strong magic. They make you have good luck. Not like fried chicken when you're not looking for it, but things like long life and good health and passing six-week tests. These are real valuable to somebody. I'm going to put them in my trunk. Before Jem went to his room, he looked for a long time at the Radley place. He seemed to be thinking again. Turn to page 42. At long last, Dill is back for the summer that will change their lives irrevocably. About halfway down page 42. Our first days of freedom and we were tired. I wondered what the summer would bring. We had strolled to the front yard where Dill stood looking down the street at the dreary face of the Radley place. I smell death. I do. I mean it. You mean when somebody's dying you can smell it? No. I mean I can smell somebody and tell if they're gonna die. An old lady taught me how. Dill leaned over and sniffed me. Jean, Louise, Finch, you're going to die in three days. Vivid imaginations for all of them. Turn to page 43, second paragraph. James scowled darkly at me. 
Well, are we going to play anything or not? Well, let's roll in the tyre, I suggested. You know I'm too big. Well, you can push. I ran to the backyard and pulled an old car tyre from under the house. I slapped it up to the front yard. I'm first. Dill said he ought to be first. He just got here. Jem arbitrated, awarded me first push with an extra time for Dill, and I folded myself inside the tyre. And I hope every one of you has been able to do this at least once in your childhood. Skip a paragraph. The tyre bumped on gravel, skeeted across the road, crashed into a barrier, and popped me like a cork onto pavement. Dizzy and nauseated, I lay on the cement and shook my head, still pounded my ears to silence, and heard Jem's voice. Scout! Get away from there! Come on! I raised my head and stared at the Radley Place steps in front of me. I froze. Come on, Scout, don't just lie there. Jem was screaming. Get up, can't you? I got to my feet, trembling as I thawed. Get the tire, bring it with you. Ain't you got any sense at all? When I was able to navigate, I ran back to them as fast as my shaking knees would carry me. Why didn't you bring it? Or why didn't you get it? Jem was silent. Go on, it ain't far inside the gate. Why, you even touched the house once, remember? Jem looked at me furiously, couldn't decline, ran down the sidewalk, treaded water at the gate, then dashed in and retrieved the tire. See there, nothing to it. I swear, Scout, sometimes you act so much like a girl, it's mortifying. There was more to it than he knew, but I decided not to tell him. Skip a paragraph. I know what we're going to play. Something new. Something different. What? asked Dill. Boo Radley. Three lines. Boo Radley? How? Uh, Scout, you can be Mrs. Radley. I declare if I will, I don't think it's the matter. Still scared? He can get out at night, when we're all asleep. Scout, how's he going to know what we're doing? Besides, I don't think he's still there. He died years ago, and they stuffed him up the chimney. Dill said, Jem, you and me can play, and Scout can watch if she's scared. Four lines. Jem parceled out our roles. I was Mrs. Radley, and all I had to do was come out and sweep the porch. Dill was old Mr. Radley. He walked up and down the sidewalk and coughed when Jem spoke to him. Jem, naturally, was Boo. He went under the front steps and shrieked and howled from time to time. As the summer progressed, so did our game. We polished and perfected it, added dialogue and plot, until we had manufactured a small play upon which we rang changes every day. Skip a paragraph. Jem was a born hero. It was a melancholy little drama woven from bits and scraps of gossip and neighbourhood legend. Mrs. Radley had been beautiful until she married Mr. Radley and lost all her money. She also lost most of her teeth, her hair, and her right forefinger, Dill's contribution, Bill, uh, sorry, Boo bit it off one night when he couldn't find any cats and squirrels to eat. She sat in the living room and cried most of the time, while Boo slowly whittled away all the furniture in the house. The three of us were the boys who got into trouble. I was the probate judge for a change. Dill led Jem away and crammed him beneath the steps, poking him with the brush broom. Jem would reappear as needed in the shapes of the sheriff, assorted townsfolk, and Miss Stephanie Crawford, who had more to say about the Radleys than anybody in Maycomb. When it was time to play Boo's big scene, Jem would sneak into the house, 
steal the scissors from the sewing machine drawer when Calpurnia's back was turned, then sit in the swing and cut up newspapers. Dill would walk by, cough at Jem, and Jem would fake a plunge into Dill's thigh. And from where I stood, it looked real. Skip six lines. One day we were so busily playing Chapter 25, Book 2 of One Man's Family, we didn't see Attica standing on the sidewalk looking at us, slapping a rolled magazine against his knee. The sun said 12 noon. What are you all playing? Nothing. What are you doing with those scissors then? Why are you tearing up that newspaper? If it's today's, I'll tan you. Nothing. Nothing what? Nothing, sir. Give me those scissors. They're no things to play with. Does this by any chance have anything to do with the Radleys? No, sir. I hope it doesn't. Jim, shut up. He's gone in the living room. He can hear us in there. Safely in the yard, Dill asked Jem if we could play any more. I don't know. Atticus didn't say we couldn't. Jem, I think Atticus knows it anyway. No, he don't. If he did, he'd say he did. I wasn't so sure, but Jem told me I was being a girl that girls always imagined things. That's why other people hated them so. And if I started behaving like one, I could just go off and find some to play with. All right, you just keep it up. You'll find out. Atticus's arrival was the second reason I wanted to quit the game. The first reason happened the day I rolled into the Radley front yard. Through all the head shaking, quelling of nausea and gem yelling, I had heard another sound. So low I could not have heard it from the sidewalk. Someone inside the house was laughing. In Chapter 5 we see how Scout feels the absence of a mother figure. And as Jem and Dill play together and form a strong bond this summer, Scout is often at a loose end, and she ends up talking to Miss Maudie Atkinson, one of the maternal roles in her life. Chapter 5. I'm skipping the beginning of the chapter and going straight to page 48, the second paragraph. Our tacit treaty with Miss Maudie was that we could play on her lawn, eat her scuppernongs if we didn't jump on the arbor, and explore her vast back lot. Terms so generous we seldom spoke to her, so careful were we to preserve the delicate balance of our relationship. But Jem and Dill drove me closer to her with their behavior. By the way, scuppernongs are a kind of grape, so they eat the fruit and don't climb on the vines. Miss Maudie, hated her house. Time spent indoors was time wasted. She was a widow, a chameleon lady who worked in her flower beds in an old straw hat and men's coveralls. But after her five o'clock bath, she would appear on the porch and reign over the street in magisterial beauty. Skip 13 lines. Her speech was crisp for a Maycomb County inhabitant. She called us by all our names, and when she grinned, she revealed two minute gold prongs clipped to her eye teeth. When I admired them and hoped I would have some eventually, she said, Look here. And with a click of her tongue, she thrust out her bridge work, a gesture of cordiality that cemented our friendship. The bridge work? That's her false teeth. So she endears herself to Scout by forcing out the false teeth from her mouth so that Scout can have a closer look. Miss Maudie's benevolence extended to Jem and Dill. Whenever they paused in their pursuits, 
We reaped the benefits of a talent Miss Maudie had hitherto kept hidden from us. She made the best cakes in the neighbourhood. When she was admitted into our confidence, every time she baked, she made a big cake and three little ones, and she would call across the street, Jem Finch, Scott Finch, Charles Baker Harris, come here. Our promptness was always rewarded. Skip a paragraph. Miss Maudie, I said one evening, do you think Boo Radley's still alive? His name's Arthur, and he's alive. Uh, yes, um, how do you know? Know what, child? Well, that b Mr. Arthur is still alive. What a morbid question. But I suppose it's a morbid subject. I know he's alive, Jean Louise, because I haven't seen him carried out yet. Well, maybe he died, and they stuffed him up the chimney. Where did you get such a notion? Well, that's what Jem said he thought they did. He gets more like Jack Finch every day. Miss Maudie had known Uncle Jack Finch, Atticus's brother, since they were children. Nearly the same age they had grown up together at Finch's Landing. Five lines. We saw Uncle Jack every Christmas, and every Christmas he yelled across the street for Miss Maudie to come marry him. Miss Maudie would yell back, Call a little louder, Jack Finch, and they'll hear you at the post office. I haven't heard you yet. Jim and I thought this a strange way to ask for a lady's hand in marriage, but then Uncle Jack was rather strange. He said he was trying to get Miss Maudie's goat that he had been trying unsuccessfully for 40 years, that he was the last person in the world Miss Maudie would think about marrying, but the first person she thought about teasing, and the best offence to her was spirited offence, all of which we understood clearly. Obviously, ironically meant, she doesn't understand any of that. Arthur Radley just stays in the house, that's all. Wouldn't you stay in the house if you didn't want to come out? Yes, um, but I'd want to come out. Why doesn't he? You know that story as well as I do. I, I never heard why, though. And nobody ever told me why. Well, you know old Mr. Radley was a foot-washing Baptist. Well, that's what you are, ain't it? My shell's not that hard, child. I'm just a Baptist. Well, don't you all believe in foot washing? We do, at home in the bathtub. But we can't have communion with you all. Apparently deciding that it was easier to define primitive baptistry than closed communion, Miss Maudie said, Foot washers believe anything that's pleasure is a sin. Did you know some of them came out of the woods one Saturday and passed by this place? and told me me and my flowers were going to hell. Your flowers too? Yes, ma'am, they'd burn right with me. They thought I spent too much time in God's outdoors and not enough time inside the house reading the Bible. Next page. Well, that ain't right, Miss Maudie. You're the best lady I know. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Thing is, foot washers think women are a sin by definition. They take the Bible literally, you know. Is that why Mr. Arthur stays in the house? To keep away from women? Oh, I've no idea. It doesn't make sense to me. It looks like if Mr. Arthur was hankering after heaven, he'd come out on the porch at least. Attica says, God's loving folks like you love yourself. You are too young to understand it. But sometimes the Bible in the hand of one man is worse than a whiskey bottle in the hand of, oh, of your father. Atticus doesn't drink whiskey. He never drank a drop in his life. No, yes, he did. He said he drank some one time and he didn't like it. I wasn't talking about your father. What I meant was, if Atticus Finch drank until he was drunk, he wouldn't be as hard as some men are at their best. They are just some kind of men who, 
who are so busy worrying about the next world, they've never learned to live in this one. And you can look down the street and see the results. Do you think they're true? All those things they say about B Mr. Arthur? What things? I told her. Eight lines. No, child, that is a sad house. I remember Arthur Radley when he was a boy. He always spoke nicely to me, no matter what folks said he did. Spoke as nicely as he knew how. You reckon he's crazy? If he's not, he should be by now. The things that happen to people we never really know. What happens in houses behind closed doors? What secrets? Well, Atticus don't ever do anything to Jem and me in the house that he don't do in the yard. Gracious child, I was raveling a thread. I wasn't even thinking about your father. But now that I am, I'll say this. Atticus Finch is the same in his house as he is on the public streets. Now, how'd you like some fresh pound cake to take home? Oh, I liked it very much. I think... It can be quite a difficult passage to understand the references to foot washing, Baptists, etc. So if you look at the quote that I have put on the screen, it might clarify it for you. Miss Maudie says that sometimes the Bible in the hand of one man is worse than a whiskey bottle in the hand of another. So what she's saying is that sometimes these evangelical extremist Christians can be so unforgiving, so rigid, that they cause misery all around them, possibly more misery than an alcoholic could cause on his family. So in a very gentle way, she criticizes the Radleys and what they did to their son, Boo. The children are still fascinated by Boo Radley, despite advice from Atticus and Maudie. Page 52. Next morning when I awakened, I found Jem and Dill in the backyard deep in conversation. When I joined them, as usual, they said, go away. Will not? This yard's as much mine as it is yours, Jem Finch. I got just as much right to play in it as you have. Well, if you stay, you've got to do what we tell you. Well, who's so high and mighty all of a sudden? Well, if you don't say you'll do what we tell you, we ain't going to tell you anything. You act like you grew ten inches in the night. All right, what is it? We are going to give a note to Boo Radley. Just how? Jem was merely going to put the note on the end of a fishing pole and stick it through the shutters. If anyone came along, Dill would ring the bell. Dill raised his right hand, and in it was my mother's silver dinner bell. I'm going round to the side of the house. We looked yesterday from across the street, and there's a shutter loose. I think maybe I can make it stick on the window sill at least. Jem, well now you're in it, and you can't get out of it. You'll just stay in it, Miss Priss. Okay, okay, but I don't want to watch. Jem, somebody, w yes, you will. You'll watch the back end of the lot, and Dill's going to watch the front of the house and up the street. And if anybody comes, he'll ring the bell. That clear? All right, then. Well, what did you write him? Well, we're asking him real politely to come out sometimes and to tell us what he does in there. We said we wouldn't hurt him and we'd buy him an ice cream. You've all gone crazy. He'll kill us. Well, it's my idea. I figure if he'd come out and sit a spell with us, he might feel better. Well, how do you know he don't feel good? Well, how do you feel if you'd been shut up for a hundred years with nothing but cats to eat? I bet he's got a beard down to here. Like your daddy's? Oh, he ain't got a beard. He... Adil stopped, as if trying to remember. Uh-huh. Caught ya. You said before you were off the train good, your daddy had a black beard. Oh, if it's all the same to you, he shaved it off last summer. Yeah, and I've got the letter to prove it. He sent me two dollars too. Ah, keep on. I reckon he even sent you a mounted police uniform. And that's never showed up, did it? You just keep on telling them, son. 
Dill Harris could tell the biggest ones I ever heard. Among other things, he'd been up in a mail plane 17 times. He'd been to Nova Scotia. He'd seen an elephant. And his granddaddy was Brigadier General Joe Wheeler and left him his sword. You will hush. He scuttled beneath the house and came out with a yellow bamboo pole. Do you reckon this is long enough to reach from the sidewalk? Well, anybody is brave enough to go up and touch the house hadn't ought to use a fishing pole. Why don't you just knock the front door down? This is different. How many times do I have to tell you that? Dill took a piece of paper from his pocket and gave it to Jem. The three of us walked cautiously towards the old house. Dill remained at the light pole on the front corner of the lot, and Jem and I edged down the sidewalk parallel to the side of the house. I walked beyond Jem and stood where I could see around the curve. All clear, not a soul in sight. Jem looked up the sidewalk to Dill, who nodded. Jem attached the note to the end of the fishing pole, let the pole out across the yard and pushed it towards the window he had selected. The pole lacked several inches of being long enough, and Jem leaned over as far as he could. I watched him making jabbing motions for so long I abandoned my post and went to him. I can't get it off the pole, or if I get it off I can't make it stay. Go on back down the street, Scott. I returned and gazed around the curve at the empty road. Occasionally, I looked back at Jem, who was patiently trying to place the note on the windowsill. It would flutter to the ground and Jem would jab it up, until I thought if Boo Radley ever received it, he wouldn't be able to read it. I was looking down the street when the dinner bell rang. Shoulder up, I reeled around to face Boo Radley and his bloody fangs. Instead... I saw Dill ringing the bell with all his might in Atticus's face. Jem looked so awful, I didn't have the heart to tell him I told him so. He trudged along, dragging the pole behind him on the sidewalk. Atticus said, stop ringing that bell. Jem, what were you doing? Nothing, sir. I don't want any of that. Tell me. I was... We were just trying to give something to Mr. Radley. What were you trying to give him? Just a letter. Let me see it. Jem held out a filthy piece of paper. Atticus took it and tried to read it. Why do you want Mr. Radley to come out? Oh, we thought he might enjoy us. Son... I'm going to tell you something and tell you one time. Stop tormenting that man. And that goes for the other two of you. Skip a paragraph. We weren't making fun of him. We weren't laughing at him. We were just... So that was what you were doing, wasn't it? Making fun of him? No. Putting his life's history on display for the edification of the neighbourhood. I didn't say we were doing that. I didn't say it. <laughs> you just told me. Now you stop this nonsense right now. Every one of you. Jem gaped at him. You want to be a lawyer, don't you? Our father's mouth was suspiciously firm as if he were trying to hold it in line. Jem decided there was no point in quibbling and was silent. In Chapter 6, we have the children's final attempt to make contact with Boo Radley. It's the last night of the summer holiday before Dill returns to his mother. We're going to go to page 57, second paragraph from the top. Dill stretched, yawned and said altogether too casually, I know what? Let's go for a walk. Well, he sounded fishy to me. Nobody in Maycomb just went for a walk. Where to, Dill? Dill jerked his head in a southerly direction. Jem said, OK, 
When I protested, he said sweetly, Well, you don't have to come along, Angel May. Well, you don't have to go, remember? Well, Jem was not one to dwell on f past defeats. It seemed the only message he got from Atticus was insight into the art of cross-examination. Scott, we ain't going to do anything. We're just going to the streetlight and back. We strolled silently down the sidewalk, listening to porch swings, creaking with the weight of the neighbourhood, listening to the soft night murmurs of the grown people on our street. Occasionally, we heard Miss Stephanie Crawford laugh. Well, OK. Why don't you go on home, Scott? Or what are you going to do? Well, Dill and Jim, we're simply going to peep in the window with the loose shutter to see if they could get a look at Boo Radley. And if I didn't want to go with them, I could go straight home and keep my fat flopping mouth shut. That was all. But why in the Sam Holy Hill did you wait till tonight? Well, because nobody would see them at night. Because Atticus would be so deep in a book he wouldn't hear the kingdom coming. Because if Boo Radley killed them, they'd miss school instead of vacation. And because it was easier to see inside a dark house in the dark than in the daytime. Did I understand? Jem, please. Scout? I'm telling you for the last time, shut your trap or go home. I declare to the Lord you're getting more like a girl every day. Well, with that, I had no option but to join them. We thought it was better to go under the high wire fence at the rear of the Radley lot. We stood less chance of being seen. The fence enclosed a large garden and a narrow wooden outhouse. Jem held up the bottom wire and motioned Dill under it. I followed and held up the wire for Jem. It was a tight squeeze for him. Don't make a sound. Don't get in a row of collards, whatever you do. They'll wake the dead. With this thought in mind, I made perhaps one step per minute. I moved faster when I saw Jem far ahead beckoning in the moonlight. We came to the gate that divided the garden from the backyard. Jem touched it. The gate squeaked. Spit on it. You've got us in a box, Jem. We can't get out of here so easy. Shh! Spit on it, Scout. We spat ourselves dry. And Jem opened the gate slowly, lifting it aside and resting it on the fence. We were in the backyard. And I'm sure you realize what the spitting is all about, to lubricate the hinges of the gate so that it will open quietly. The last two lines of page 58. Give you a hand up. Wait though. Jem grabbed his left wrist and my right wrist. I grabbed my left wrist and Jem's right wrist. We crouched and Dill sat on our saddle. We raised him up and he caught the window sill. Hurry, we can't last much longer. Dill punched my shoulder and we lowered him to the ground. What did you see? Nothing. Curtains. There's a little teeny light way off somewhere though. Let's get away from here. Let's go round in back again. Shh. Let's try the back window. Dill, no. Six lines. And then I saw the shadow. It was the shadow of a man with a hat on. At first I thought it was a tree, but there was no wind blowing and tree trunks never walked. The back porch was bathed in moonlight and the shadow, crisp as toast, moved across the porch towards Jem. Dill saw it next. He put his hands to his face. When it crossed Jem, Jem saw it. He put his arms over his head and went rigid. Four lines. Jem leaped off the porch and galloped towards us. He flung open the gate, danced Dill and me through and shooed us between two rows of swishing collards. Halfway through the collards, I tripped 
as I tripped, the roar of a shotgun shattered the neighborhood. Dill and Jem dived beside me. Jem's breath came in sobs. Fence! By the schoolyard! Hurry! Scout! Jem held the bottom wire. Dill and I rolled through and were halfway to the shelter of the schoolyard's solitary oak. When we sensed that Jem was not with us, we ran back and found him struggling in the fence, kicking his pants off to get loose. He ran to the oak tree in his shorts. Safely behind it, we gave way to numbness, but Jem's mind was racing. We got to get home. They'll miss us. Skip a paragraph. Respiration normal. The three of us strolled as casually as we could to the front yard. We looked down the street and saw a circle of neighbours at the Red Radley front gate. Well, we'd better go down there. They'll think it's funny if we don't show up. Mr. Nathan Radley was standing inside his gate, a shotgun broken across his arm. Atticus was standing beside Miss Mordy and Miss Stephanie Crawford. Miss Rachel and Mr. Avery were nearby. None of them saw us come up. We eased in beside Miss Mordy, who looked around. Well, where were you all? Didn't you hear the commotion? Well, what happened? asked Jem. Well, Mr. Radley shot at someone in his collard patch. Oh, did he hit him? No, shot in the air. Scared him pale, though. He says he's got the other barrel waiting for the next sound he hears in that patch, and next time he won't aim high, be it dog. Jem Finch! Ma'am, where are your pants, son? Pants, sir? Pants! Um, Mr. Finch? What is it, Dill? Um, I won them from him. Won them? How? Oh. Uh, we were playing strip poker up yonder by the fish pool. Jem and I relaxed. The neighbours seemed satisfied. They all stiffened. But what was strip poker? We had no chance to find out. Miss Rachel went off like the town fire siren. Do Jesus, Dill Harris, gambling by my fish pool. I'll strip poker you, sir. Um... Just a minute, Miss Rachel, says Atticus. I've never heard of them doing that before. Were you all playing cards? Oh, no, sir. Just with matches. Jem, Scout, I don't want to hear of poker in any form again. Go by Dills and get your pants, Jem. Settle it yourselves. Oh, don't worry, Dills, said Jem. She ain't going to get you. He'll talk her out of it. That was fast thinking, son. Listen, you hear? We stopped and heard Atticus's voice. Not serious. They all go through it, Miss Rachel. Dill was comforted, but Jem and I weren't. There was the problem of Jem showing up some pants in the morning. Well, I'd give you some of mine, said Dill as we came to Miss Rachel's steps. Jem said he couldn't get in them, but thanks anyway. We said goodbye and Dill went inside the house. He evidently remembered he was engaged to me, for he ran back out and kissed me swiftly in front of Jem. You're all right here, he bawled after us. Turn to the next page. Jem and Scout go to bed, but Jem doesn't fall asleep. He's got to figure out a way to get his trousers back. Are you asleep, little three eyes? Are you crazy? Shh! Atticus's lights out. I'm going after them. You can't. I won't let you. I've got to. You do and I'll wake up Atticus. You do and I'll kill you. I pulled him down beside me on the cot. I tried to reason with him. Mr. Nathan's going to find them in the morning, Jem. He knows you lost them. And when he shows them to Atticus, it'll be pretty bad and that's all there is to it. Go back to bed. Well, that's what I know. And that's why I am going after them. I was desperate. Look, it ain't worth it, Jem. A licking hurts, but it doesn't last. You'll get your head shot off, Jem, please. I, it's like this, Scott. 
Atticus ain't ever whipped me since I can remember, and I want to keep it that way. Well, this was a thought. It seemed that Atticus threatened us every other day. You mean he's never caught you at anything? Maybe so, but I just want to keep it that way, Scott. We should have done that tonight, Scott. It was then, I suppose, that Jem and I first began to part company. Sometimes I didn't understand him, but my periods of bewilderment were short-lived. This was beyond me. Please, can't you just think about it for a minute? By yourself on that play? Shut up. Well, it's not like he'd never speak to you again or something. I'm going to wake him up, Jem. I swear I am. Jem grabbed my pyjama collar and wrenched it tight. Well, then I'm going with you. No, you ain't. You'll just make noise. Well, it was no use. I unlatched the back door and held it while he crept down the steps. It must have been two o'clock. The moon was setting and the latticework shadows were fading into fuzzy nothingness. Jem's white shirt tail dipped and bobbed like a small ghost dancing away to escape the coming morning. A faint breeze stirred and cooled the sweat running down my sides. Last paragraph. Jem finally returns. There he was, returning to me. His white shirt bobbed over the back fence and slowly grew larger. He came up the back steps, latched the door behind him, and sat on his cot. Wordlessly, he held up his pants. He lay down, and for a while I heard his cot trembling. Soon he was still, and I didn't hear him stir again. And that ends this lesson's reading. Incidentally, the cot that is referred to in the novel is not a baby's cot as we would know it. It means a truckle bed, a camp bed, an informal bed. Right, in your notebooks I want you to jot down your responses, your thoughts to these sections, these questions. The gifts that were left in the tree. Who do you think left them there and why? And I also suggest that you make a list of the gifts that they find in the tree. What we read today won't be the last of the gifts. The second point on this slide, this game with Boo Radley. Two questions I'd like you to think about. Why do the children so desperately want to make contact with Boo Radley? And the second, why is Atticus so against their attempts to make contact with him? As you focus on characters in the novel, I'd like you to pause here to think about Miss Maudie Atkinson. Um, I would like you to make notes on her role in the novel, particularly as a mother figure to Jem, but particularly to Scott. And then also take note of the way she talks about Boo Radley. There's far more sympathy and kindness from her. And that's in sharp contrast to the imagination of the children and what they believe Boo looks like and what he does. And then the second bullet point on this slide, femininity as a theme. Gender roles are important. And we've heard quite a few times in this reading today that Jem teases Scout and says every day you're getting more and more like a girl. It's got a lot to do with Scout's identity. So have a think about that and start your notes on the gender issues that you see here. Once you've responded to those reading issues that we looked at in the previous slides, I'd like you to answer these six questions based on chapters four to six of the novel. Please remember to write in detail and to reference the text as often as possible. Embed your quotes in the way that you have been taught. When you have finished the answers to those questions, then please take this worksheet and match key quotes for each theme. 
and the themes on this page are education, prejudice, femininity, and growing up. And you'll add that to the pages that you got on theme in the first lesson. So there's quite a bit of work to be done, but you've got the rest of this week to complete this. This has been another long lesson. I hope you've broken it up into manageable chunks and spread it over the three lessons for this week. Until the next time, goodbye and wash your hands, wear your masks, sanitize wherever you go.